Well, where do we start? <laughs> Maybe I'll give a little hoo 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 hoo. Turn this thing down, or I'm gonna have to start whispering. Maybe I ought to give a little bit before we get into why in the world do y'all have an interest in homesteading in the first place? There has been in the last couple years when I got into this, it's been a long time ago, over 40 to 45 years ago. And um, back when I got into it, only the hippies were doing it, which is where I came from. <laughs> so I was introduced to country living because I grew up in a city right here in California down south of here and that's all I knew of city living and so back many many years ago I was introduced to country living from these hippies that had a cafe in town and they were raising food for the cafe and I said well that's really cool <laughs> and that's how I kind of got really I got a desire like wow that's a really you know kind of a neat thing there was a lot of other things you don't want to talk about but that I thought was pretty neat so anyways a little bit about us or at least myself I grew up here in California and um, ended up getting married and that was probably the biggest step I made and wanting me to get out of California. I didn't want to raise my children here. Things were too getting too crazy. Uh, taxes, land, everything back in those years were still escalating, as you know it is today. So we progressed to look, you know, elsewhere to, you know, find, you know, property that we could afford to live on that... Um, and I didn't know. I mean, I was young. Uh, in fact, I had graduated from Los Altos uh, International College of Naturopaths. And so I was a naturopathic physician trained. And that's what took me back east, literally, is I went back there and I set up practice in North Carolina. Well, I don't know. I don't know where y'all are coming from, but... It just was not where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be closed into an office. I didn't want that environment to grow, my children to grow up under because it would put you right back into a city kind of environment. And so we started looking for a piece of land and that's really how we started moving towards the homesteading lifestyle. And we will try to discuss a little bit about the principles of homesteading. And apparently you all are here because you have an interest in something about homesteading. I know there's a lot of different ideas and opinions and you're going to get my opinion about homesteading. Because we have done it, we have worked on the far end of homesteading completely off grid, which is where we are at today. And we will be discussing some of the principles of why. Why do you have an interest in homesteading? You ever ask yourself that question? Now, I don't know where you all are at. You have to forgive me. I've got a little southern left in me. But we have met in the last two years more Californians than I ever thought I'd ever meet. They've all left California. You know where they've ended up? Tennessee and Kentucky. <laughs> a lot of them. And I was always curious, you know, why did you all leave California? Well, I don't dare go into telling you all why they left California. It's probably the same reason why you've got a mindset of why you're here tonight and wanting to learn a little bit about homesteading. I'm going to tell you. We're going to look at a few things in this book. And I don't know where you all are coming from. I haven't always been a believer, but I am now. And I'm very thankful for this book. It has given me a lot of direction, 
Well, we're going to look at a few things. But I don't know if you've been watching where the world is today. And the, the political world and the religious world, they seem to be getting closer and closer together. Have you watched any of that? It should concern us a bit. And it concerns me greatly. In fact, I don't think I'd be out here today if I didn't have a concern for all of us. It's, it's, it's scary what's going on in this country if you watch the news at all. And I'm just speaking off the cuff. I've been doing this for a long time and I never thought I'd ever see the day. You know, we talked about it. In fact, I can remember as a bunch of hippies sitting around a table in the cafe talking about there's going to come a day when you can't buy and sell. You ever hear anything of that? Well, that's the first time I had ever heard anything like that. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's things happening in this country and it's not just in this country. You've seen that the world in general is turning upside down in all kinds of directions. Have you asked yourself the question, what would you do if all of a sudden the plug was pulled tonight? You know, it's very real. Back where I live, the CEO of the electric company that controls Tennessee, Kentucky, and part of Missouri, there's five states within that that co-op has openly stated, and this is not just there, it's happening across this country. That they're, they're concerned because, and I'm going to try to stay off the political box right now, but I can't help it a little bit. We got an administration that is killing the electric company in this country. As of tonight, they could plug, unplug this power grid like that. Like that. Where would you stand if your power system shut down? Do you know you couldn't get fuel for your automobile? What about the food that you get out of Walmart? You know, we talked about this 45 years ago. We all kind of lost track of it as time went on because it didn't happen, did it? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm hoping it won't happen again. But it doesn't look very good right now. So I want to shake you up a little bit. The reason why I moved to the country is because I wanted a little bit of freedom and a little bit of independence to where I could grow some food and not worry about my children starving because I can't get it out of Walmart. Yeah. This is the talk that I'm hearing from a lot of the Californians that are moving back east. A lot of folks that I have met that are coming and trying to figure out how to homestead and live on the land. And some of these dear folk are struggling because they're coming straight out of the city life. And they don't know the first thing of how to grow a squash. A g <laughs> Never grew a garden ever. I mean, that's the way I grew up. I grew up in a city and I didn't know anything about growing food. I didn't think I needed to because I knew the store, Walmart, or, well, Walmart wasn't thin back then, but Safeways and places like that. But now, you know, when COVID hit, it should have woke some of us up because some of these stores was showing the shelves to become more and more bare. So as we look at the subject a little tonight, and as we move through these few lectures dealing with this, we're just going to be touching 
some areas because there's no way I can exhaust it. It's, it's got a lot of information to deal with. I guess I ought to ask y'all where, where you're at. What's your interests? I think the clock is running out. Okay. Over the years, I've been very fortunate to learn, you know, how to live with the land and on the land. And honestly, I never thought I'd ever be out here lecturing on living in the country. But things happen to where I've been put out here to share at least my experience with with you folks. I started when I went to Central America and I was homesteading down the jungle because I wanted to get out of the good old USA because of its capitalistic mindset. And so I went down there with some friends of mine and we were homesteading and that was my first real introduction to living on the land. And we lived way back out in the mountains. So what food we had is what we grew. It was all a new education for me. I mean, I came right out of, out of, well, Fresno, right down the road. I came out of that town or that city, and I went straight down to Central America. <laughs> and I had no clue what I was doing. But I got introduced, and it's been from that time forward that my life has been kind of centered to a degree around how to live on the land and live with the land. And how do you make the land make a living for you while you're living on that land? That's one of the big things that we've seen with a lot of homesteaders is they go out to the homestead and they fail because they really don't know how to make it really work. All right. And I've been thankful that you know, we've been given somewhat of an education, I guess quite an education on working with the land and, you know, working with the land and how to make it work for us. And Saturday evening and Sunday afternoon, we're going to dis discuss some of the real practical things about what we're talking about when we're talking about homesteading, all right? And the things you need to be looking for or the things you need to be thinking about and getting that mind re-educated to think differently because we've got to start thinking differently folks we cannot think the way things are going right now now I want to look at a few thoughts with you folks tonight and it's coming from this book so if you're not a believer please don't take it as, as I'm attacking you or that it is attacking you, but I'm very thankful. When I first read this, I was, sh I was just kind of blown away, to be honest with you. Jesus' disciples came to him and asked him this question in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. In verse 3 it said, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What was on their minds? Did you ever ask those questions to yourself? When is this going to come to an end? Have you? Uh, you should. You should be asking those questions. Seriously. And I don't want to be preaching at you folks because I don't like to be preached at. But we need to seriously ask our, these, these very same questions. When shall these things be? Jesus just got done discussing some things and we're going to talk about that tomorrow with his disciples. And they were all concerned about what he had just talked to them about in chapter 23 and in chapter 22 
and in chapter 21. And so their minds were all stimulated on this idea of something was coming upon Jerusalem. We're going to look at this tomorrow a little closer. And again, we're not going to be able to you know, completely expound on it, but we're going to look at a few things, enough to stimulate your minds to get you thinking. Jesus was one of the most incredible teachers. Um, he had the most amazing ability, because I think his father dwelt in him through his spirit, that he could teach things, and it sounded like he was saying two things, but yet he was saying one thing that meant two things. Do you understand what I just said? This lesson in chapter 24 is pretty amazing, and I don't have the time to unravel this whole chapter with you. But it's amazing when you start peeling this, this banana peeling back, if you please, what you start seeing in this chapter. And he, as they asked him the question, he says, what shall, uh, it says, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. Hmm. How many of us in this room believe there's going to be an end of the world? Everybody ought to raise their hand up in here. Because I'm going to tell you something. If the world keeps going the way it is, we're in big, big trouble. I... I <laughs> I'm having a hard time because I usually lecture about organic gardening right here. But do you know that the food reserves in the United States used to have a five-year five reserve in case of something happening in this country? Do you know how much reserve we have in the United States now? Who said it? I heard someone say it. Did you say it? How much? There's none. What do you think is going to happen if a crisis hits? <laughs> do you know how long your food will last on the shelves right here in this good old city of Sacramento? How many people are here in the Sacramento region? Three million? Get your head wrapped around that. I mean, it's, it, it's staggering in your mind to think if things got haywacky, what's going to happen to three million people? Now you wonder why you want to get out in the country? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that ought to do something to our minds to make us think, just like the disciples when they said, what are these things going to take place? What do we look for? How soon is it coming? I know we've got some elders in this room, and they're older than I am. And I'm pushing 70. And I first started thinking these things when I was in my 20s. And I'm still asking the question, No, I take that back. I'm not asking it anymore because I see it happening. I'm not asking, when's it going to come, Lord? I'm saying, Lord, help me to be ready for what's coming and help me to help others to get ready for what's coming. Because it's coming and it just gave me chills up my spine just right now just saying that. I... I, I I don't know how to speak, but I wished I could just shake all of you out of your sleep. That's how scary this thing is. And I'm not just saying this to preach it, but it is real. What do you think would happen if the trucking industry went on strike? Yeah. 
So, I want to ask you all again the question. How many of us in this room believe that's going to be an end of this world as we know it? How many believe in this room that Jesus is going to come back? You know, that was the discussion here. This was the discussion. The disciples were concerned. Lord, we, do, we want to know what to be looking for. We don't want to be asleep on our post. Right off the bat... Jesus asked or answered the question and started this, this dissertation. And like I said, folks, we're not going to have time to unravel this thing completely. But it is here in chapter 24. If you want a roadmap to show you the way out of here, get to study in chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. It's amazing. Jesus said to them, he says... In verse 4, he says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Deceive you about what? Oh, you can stay living in these cities. Everything's okay. Don't get worried and concerned. We got it all under control, you know. Do you think that was a part of it? Ha, <laughs> ha, let me tell you something. Jesus told them something about what was coming on Jerusalem, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow, that it was a picture of what's coming upon the end of the world. This dual kind of concept that Jesus was talking about, he wanted his disciples not to be deceived about what was coming and what his coming was going to be like. Do you know what he said at the end of this lecture? He said this in verse 50. The Lord of the servants shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. What were they going to be deceived about? Go back to verse 48. It says these servants were saying, The Lord delayeth his coming. He's not coming. Don't worry about it, folks. Donald Trump's going to turn this thing around and make all things good again. You think? Maybe. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I'm not a politician. I don't want to get into politics here. But Donald Trump isn't our savior. And I'm not going to preach anti because I'm not anti. I'm just telling you the thing we have to be careful about is this deception. Jesus was concerned that his followers would become deceived about what was coming upon this world and about his second coming. And as you study this thing, you'll see as it unravels Jesus, in this lecture of chapter 24, talked about his second coming nine to ten times. And the end of the world. Now, if that's not enough, we'll go into a little deeper. In this very lecture... In this very thoughts that Jesus was laying down, I am not going to take the time to unravel this whole thing, but I want to pick a few pieces out of here in hopes to stimulate your minds enough to maybe motivate you in a mass exodus. Out of here. <laughs> now, when we look at this, there was something that Jesus said to these disciples and it was dealing with this very subject matter of dealing with what are we to expect. I 
like I said, tomorrow we'll look at a little more on that, but I want to look at one part and he, he pulls up in this discussion, he says, no one knows the day nor the hour when he comes. Do you think that's right? I think it's right. I think it's very right. And he wanted his disciples to know, don't go sitting there set in time. But he went and he said, just after he said that, he says, but we can know that it's even at the door. What does that mean? Now, I've heard a lot of folks say, oh, you people that believe in the second coming of Jesus, you just are way out there. We can't tell when the day or the hour is when the Lord will return. Well, I'm going to tell you something. They're saying this very same thing about the end of the world. You know that, right? As if the world is going to continue to go on. Do you know why some of the men today in this country, some of the wealthiest men in this country that are buying up land as fast as they can buy it up, do you know why they're doing this? And why they're building bunkers out in the middle of nowhere? These people are non-believers. They don't believe in a God in heaven. They don't believe in a Savior. But they do believe that something's coming upon this world that's tremendous. Some of these men, and I won't even, I, I shouldn't have used Donald Trump's name, but there, there are men in this country that are very wealthy. And they're doing what they're doing because they know that something's coming. It's even at the door. I believe that's how close we are, brethren. I believe it's closer than we realize. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't go talking this stuff because I don't like to rattle gates unnecessary. Unnecessarily, I guess, is the way you should say it. But I think our doors need to be rattling. Our gates need to be rattled a little bit here. I believe the things that Jesus told his disciples when they asked him the question that he was trying to answer them, this question that they were asking, that these are the things to look for. This is what's going to come. And this will help you to know how soon it is. Verse 36. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father uh, only knows. Then he started to, into this discussion, and this is what I want to look at with you a little bit. He says, but as the day of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What was the days of Noah like? Hmm? Now, this is not me preaching to you. Y'all share, you know, open up, talk. What was the day of Noah like? Do you know? Well, I didn't <laughs> until I went studying and searching. Let's go back to Noah. Turn to the book of Genesis with me in chapter 6. This is what is said about this people. Now I want you to think a little bit when we read these things. Where's the mindset of people today at? All right? It says in verse 5 of chapter 6 of Genesis, And God saw that the wickedness of man was <laughs> Go look that word up. It's really bad. That's how bad it was. In fact, it was so bad, it doesn't record exactly how bad it really was. At least with this story about Noah. 
It says the every imagination. What is an imagination? <laughs> Your ticker up here. Your thinking. That which your mind is wrapped around was continually wicked. That's what it was like at the day of Noah. It says every imagination of their thoughts were, uh, uh, of his heart was only evil continually. That's what their mindset was like. Now let me tell you something, folks. Thank God for the remnant people that have some kind of a conscience left. Because it's getting harder and harder and harder where people just seem like they don't have any conscience left. I mean, I don't know what you've run into, but it's pretty scary. And my brother lives down in Napa Valley. We keep in touch. And he says, you know, Ron, he said, when I came back to visit you back south about five years ago, he says, I was really shocked that there's still old timers back there to say, how you doing, young man? They're friendly. Not everybody is, but you still have a core of people that still wave at you. They don't have to know you, but they're just friendly. My brother says you're looked at as though you're a sissy if you do that on the streets today. I said, huh? He said you're looked at as though you're weak and feminine if you wave or you try to be friendly. They want to fight you. I said, my, <laughs> where, where is people's minds going? Continually wicked. I and mean, I don't need to go too deep into that to get you to understand that I think we're living in a time of history that the minds and the conscience of man is becoming more and more blunted. Wickedness is not looked at as though it's wickedness anymore. In fact, wickedness is looked at as though it's okay. That's right. Good's bad and bad's good. Now... Turn with me again back there to Matthew. I want to, I want to look at something this evening. And we could spend more time on this thing with Noah, and I would really like to. But I've got to get this across, and then we'll go back to Noah. When he talked there about Noah, it's interesting. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In chapter 17... There's something that Matthew did not record that Luke did. Now, if you know anything about those two different authors of these two different books, you'll see that one was really caught up in details, and that was Luke. Luke was a, was a real stickler for details. Matthew was more caught up in the concept of his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and things like that, which is very powerful stuff. But Luke brings out something about this thing about Noah that just really hit me really hard. And this is what I want you to hear. Verse 26 of chapter 17, it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the day of the Son of Man. All right? If you want a good study, go back and look at Noah if you want to, and you can understand but there's something that Luke says here that gives you a closer insight to what was going on at the time of Noah. And this is what he said. They did eat, they did drink, they did marry wives, and they married others, but they were given in marriage until the day of Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Is there anything wrong with marrying? Anything wrong with giving in marriage? How about eating? <laughs> I think we all like to eat, right? <laughs> all right, so 
Those things weren't bad. It was what they did to them. Now, this is what he goes on. And he says, he says, listen here. Likewise, verse 28. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot. You know who Lot was? Who was Lot, brethren? Anyone? Lot was a descendant of Noah. He was from the Shemites. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Those were the three sons of Noah that went on the boat with him and, the, and their wives. And those three boys, when they came off the boat, they went in three different directions. And Lot was a descendant of Shem. And if you want a really interesting study, you go look at that story. And it's quite interesting. Because the Sodomites, or excuse me, the Sodom and Gomorrah people, you know who they were? They were descendants of Ham. Yeah. They were relatives. That's why Lot felt comfortable to go down to Sodom. And if you read anything about Sodom in the day that Lot went down there, it wasn't a terribly bad place, but it progressively became worse and worse and worse as time went on. Now, let's look at this here. It says, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they did drink, they bought, they sold, they planted and builded. Come on, folks. Are we not doing that? Come on. I mean, I read this and it just, it struck me. Our, um, they did drink, they did bought, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they builded. Is there anything wrong with those things? What was the problem then? They were so caught up into themselves it became progressively so bad turn back to Genesis chapter 19 In chapter 19 it gives you a picture of Lot Chapter 18, you know the story that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed. Why? Because of it, its imagination was continually wicked. And it progressively became more and more wicked, didn't it? Abraham pled with the Lord in chapter 18... And he says, Lord, will you destroy the wicked if there's 50? 50 good people? What did he say? He said he couldn't find 50. And Abraham asked him, well, what about if you could find 45? Couldn't even find 45. Now, if you know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah at all, without a history lesson here, these were huge cities on the plains and it was plentiful. All the food they grew, all in that beautiful Sodom Valley. All around Sacramento, right? Sodom and Gomorrah was a beautiful place. It had everything California offers to you. 
everything. You think, you think it has a, a, another application to it? Abraham begged the Lord, if you can find 40, couldn't find 40. He said, well, if you could find 30, couldn't find 30. Went down to 20, went down to 10. And the Lord couldn't find 10 faithful. You know what happened? This is what happened. In chapter 19, it said in verse 12, it says, And the man said unto Lot, Haste thou here and get out of here. These angels that were sent from heaven told Lot, Get and get now and don't look back. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've shared this with other people that don't have any knowledge of the Bible at all. And I said, do you have any idea why you are wanting to homestead? What's driving you this direction? Remember I asked you that earlier. What's driving your interest to wanting to know something about homesteading? Lot knew nothing about country living. Lot was a city boy. Lot grew up, built his home right outside of the city of Sodom, and the city of Sodom grew up right around him. It engrossed his country living what he had. You know the whole story? Him and Abraham separated because they grew out of... There was just too many of them on both sides of the family there. So Lot chose to go to the valley, and Abraham stayed where? He went to the mountains, and that's where Abraham predominantly stayed. Then it said, and, 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 it said uh, and the man said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides thee? He said, My son-in-laws, my sons, and my daughters. And then it says, Bring them out of this place. Do you know how many came out with Lot? His sons-in-laws didn't. His daughters didn't, that were married to these men. And his sons didn't. Hmm? He didn't have sons? Well, it says here, it says, Thy sons and thy daughters. It said, Thy sons-in-laws and thy sons, that's verse 12, and thy daughters and... Whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Okay? Now, you go on in the story, and it says something here that just struck me personally a few years ago. And it still does every time I read it. So I'm just reading it to you. In verse six, or 15, it says, The angels hasten, Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. What was happening to Lot? What was happening to his family? If there is ever a reason for you to do homesteading and get out and find a country place to live, it is now because of the sodomites. Excuse. My wife told me not to go down that road. Anyways, because of the influence that it had on Lot's family. Lot lost his sons-in-laws, his daughters, and his sons, and only two of his daughters went with him, and those two daughters were so messed up. Read the story. you got the Moabites and the Amorites. And they were Sodomites. Have mercy. 
Because Lot, it says in verse 16, Lot lingered. What does the word linger mean to you? The Lord delayeth his coming. I don't have to go today. <laughs> you think? You know what happened because Lot lingered? What happened? Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt because her heart was still in Sodom. When Lot saw this wickedness going on years before, he should have taken his family and got out of there because the influence of that city was encroaching upon his family. Lot wasn't a bad man. It's just he allowed the world that was all around him to influence his children, to influence his wife and his sons-in-laws and whomsoever else. His influence was next to no good. Does that make any sense to any of you in here? Now, it says in verse 17, and it came to pass when they had, look, I know this is strong stuff, and you all just have to throw your books at me. I don't know what to do but to try to wake you people up to get out of here. I mean it. I, I, again, I'm talking right off my cuff now. It is scary. I mean, it is scary. Just walk through an airport sometime and tell me. I haven't been on an airport. I haven't come out here in years. And I'm going like, wow. <laughs> I think I want to go back home. <laughs> You know, so it's scary how desensitized we become. Now, I know I could get in a lot of trouble for talking this way. <laughs> and I can't help it. But I'm going to tell you something, brethren. We are being contaminated by living here. We are being influenced Every day we're here, and we don't realize what's happening to our brain by being around it. We are being programmed to accept things that are not acceptable. It said, Then it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, Escape unto the mountains. Do you find that interesting? I just find it kind of interesting because I have never lectured but one time on this subject dealing with homesteading. And somehow this hit me right between the eyes of why in the world do you want to go homesteading anyways? We all might have different opinions or different ideas. But I'm going to tell you something. Most folks that are doing what they're doing, some even don't even know why they're doing it. But they're being led to do something that others ought to do themselves. We've met families that are struggling how to live in the land and live in the country. But they're doing something. Does that make any sense to y'all? Now, I mean, I could go on and on, and it, it, it's all right here. Let's look back to Noah just for a minute, all right? And we'll try to hopefully put a little positive on this. Because <laughs> it, it does get a little bit heavy. In the life of Noah, back to chapter 6, I always found it interesting, and I just want to encourage you, is you, if you will take and read chapter 6 of the book of Genesis, and a few chapters after that, the Lord considered Noah 
a righteous man. Did you know that? That's chapter 7 and verse 1. Why do you think the Lord considered Noah? In fact, it's interesting that Noah is in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, which is the faith chapter. Lot wasn't. Lot was able to get out of Sodom because of Abraham. Abraham's mediation got Lot out of Sodom. It was Abraham's faith in God's delivering power that gave Lot his life. Noah was considered a righteous man because he had faith. He had faith. Now, I want you to look at something with me real quick. And I'm probably already over my time. <laughs> In Hebrews, that's all the way back there near the book of Revelation. You go back past Peter and heading back towards the front of the New Testament. Chapter 11, this is what it says about Noah. In verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. How many has seen the end of the world yet? Anybody? <laughs> we can see it's even at the door, but we haven't seen the end of the world. Noah hadn't seen the end of the world. In fact, nobody up to that time had ever seen the end of the world, had they? So Noah, by faith, being warned of God, of what? Of a flood. Of a flood. It was the destruction of the world, wasn't it? It says, being moved, it says, um, it says, warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Hmm. What did Noah's faith do to Noah? He believed in God, what he had said to him, and what did it do, Noah? It said it moved him. What does the word moved mean? It's an action word. That's exactly right. It's an action word. It means sit down right here and listen to me preach. Is that what it means? <laughs> it means after you hear the preach and do something about it. That's what it means. Isn't that right? If no one would have just sat there and procrastinated like Lot did, do you think the ark would have ever got built? You think there ever been one soul saved? No, this human race would have been done with. Is that right? But it says Noah was moved with fear. The word fear here is not scared to death. The word fear literally comes from the word with reverence. He had deep reverence for the word of God and he believed what God said to him and it moved him to do something about what God had said to him. It says here, it says in verse 7, it says, with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world what was wrong with the world? Do you know what the word condemned means? It means that everything Noah did was in opposition to what the direction of the world was going. The word condemned means in opposition. So do you think when Noah was cutting out beams that he was in opposition to the world? What do you think the world thought about him? Oh, man, you're a real nut job. 
What are you leaving your city life for and going out there in the middle of nowhere and trying to make a living out there or just living? Oh, you really kook. Believe me, when I was in private practice, a lot of my friends thought I was a nut wacko, which I was and am, for leaving my city practice and taking my family to the country and we knew very little about really how to make it work in those years. But we became moved to do something. The world was on a course of destruction. Now I want to tell you something, folks. In closing, we could spend a lot more time here. What does the word faith mean to you? Just a simple English lesson. What does the word faith mean to you? I heard, I heard more than one voice say it. Jesus says, come to the kingdom as a little child. And you know, a little child, if their parents are acting halfway right, <laughs> have a complete trust in mom and dad. Is that right? And it builds a bond between the parents and the children that no one can break. Unless there's a real big mess in the family. But this kind of faith had a faith that he had 100% trust in what God said was coming. When Jesus said to his disciples what was coming, do you think Jesus meant what he said? Absolutely, he sure did. And it says very clearly that he had that faith that moved him and became heir of the righteousness by faith. Noah was considered a righteous man because he believed what God said to him. And it moved him. Now, in closing, do you think Noah did what he did for a selfish reason? <laughs> Come on, all. <laughs> this is in closing. This is for the, the closing thought for tonight. You think Noah was considered a righteous man because he was doing this for a selfish reason? Why did Noah do what he did? Number one, he had faith in God's word and he was moved to do it. But he did it for the saving of others. <laughs> so when you go to the country and you want to go homesteading, don't go out there with a selfish mind. Think of your neighbor. Think of your friends. Think of those that know nothing about how to live out there. And let me tell you something. You can have a lot of people thinking you're a real whack job. Just like they did with Noah. You go back and read the story. And they thought Noah was out of his mind. Believe me, friends, Noah left a high-paying job. He was a very successful man and woman, as far as that goes. He had the whole world out in front of him, didn't he? Or was he just a vagabond? I think if you, you study and you find out that Noah was quite a fella. But the lesson that's here is for us, my friends. Jesus left it for us to understand and to learn. Noah had enough faith to believe what God said. And he was moved by action. Hmm? 
So my encouragement for you all tonight is pray more than you've ever prayed before. Before you jump out of your lifestyle, make good, well-rounded plans. When Noah went to build in that ark, believe me, my friends, God had given him a well-rounded plan of what to do, didn't he? We're going to try to just stimulate some of those thoughts this weekend. And we're going to try to give you a few tools to work with. And hopefully that it will encourage you to do something about what we're discussing. All right. Now, there's more to that story, but I'm not going to go on. I don't want to wear you out. I can talk for hours on it, but. I hope and pray that as we look at some of these things, tomorrow we're going we're gonna to go into a little bit more here in the book of Matthew. But the story of Noah is not near as powerful as the lesson about when shall these things come. When Jesus had that question asked him, he was talking about what was coming upon Jerusalem. His professed people. Is that right? And as you study the book of Matthew, one thing you're going to see is, like I said earlier, there is like a double picture. He took Jerusalem, and we will look at this tomorrow. He took Jerusalem and kind of superimposed it on the end of the world. So when you look at Jerusalem, what took place there with Jerusalem, you can have a pretty good idea what's coming down here. I think that's pretty amazing. And yet, for some reason, it's been there all this time, and we've just kind of like, it really doesn't mean a whole lot to us, does it? So tomorrow we're going to look look at this a little closer in this situation about Jerusalem and what the Lord had to say and a few things in history and um, see what the mindset was and what was going on that brought them to such a destructive situation. Y'all do know that, right? That's in his, it's in history. In AD 70, we're just totally wiped out. We surely don't want that, do we? Do you think it's possible that that could come again? All right, there's a few sober thoughts tonight. Hope you all can get some sleep. <laughs> But one of the things I just want to encourage you, if you do have a heart and you do want to live in the country, do it with others in mind. Do it thinking that you might, you might be the ark for somebody else. You know what I mean? Because there's going to be folks that don't know what to do. And they're going to need... They're going to need folks that have some ability to give them a haven of rest when this storm hits. All right? Okay, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, as we spend a few moments this evening and looking here in the Bible, we do ask that you would give us wisdom and skill to be able to understand these things. Oh, dear Jesus, help us to realize the seriousness of the times that we live in. Help us to be people that are awoke, are out of our sleep, and that we will be moved to do something about it. Oh, dear Jesus, please have mercy on us. It seems as though the time is running out, and it's like we just don't have much time left. Keep us now this evening and bless these folks as they go home. Pray that they come back tomorrow. May your will be done in all these things now. Amen.